guys, it's Sean here to introduce you to another bonus episode of Real Blend. This time we have an interview with writer, director, and star of I Love My Dad. Uh, it's James Morrissini. And um, this film has been making the rounds at some of the early film festivals. It went to uh, South by Southwest, where, as James will talk about uh, in the interview, it won the Audience Award. Uh, and it's based on a true story, one of those ones that once you see how it all plays out, you're going to be surprised that it's actually true. Um, essentially, and James has been telling this story almost everywhere that he shows up, uh, he was estranged from his father for various reasons. Uh, he had cut him off completely from social media and was not interacting with his dad at all. So his dad, in an effort to stay in his uh, son's inner circle, created a fake profile and essentially catfished his son. Um, and it sounds cringe, and it is really cringe, and the ways uh, that this comedy explores how this decision affected uh, both the father and the son is going to make you pretty uncomfortable. But James knows this, uh, and his he talked about in an interview uh, here how his therapist almost pushed him to explore the difficulties uh, by making a film about this. And so the end result is very intentionally uncomfortable, uh, and I think is a really strong voice for a new filmmaker that we're definitely, definitely going to want to keep an eye on. Um, in addition to James, he's joined by uh, Patton Oswalt uh, in the film who plays his father. The two of them have amazing chemistry. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, this movie more on the show now that it's reaching theaters and going a little bit wider. Uh, but so we wanted to have James on the show. And so we're really excited to uh, feature him and to feature I Love My Dad. So uh, without further ado... Let's dive right into the Real Blend interview with writer-director James Morrissini on behalf of I Love My Dad. Cool, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. I'm a fan of the podcast. Oh, really? Thank you very much. I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, That's yeah. That's so cool. So then you know we're we're kind of a, a technical podcast that likes to talk to filmmakers about every step of the process, and so feel free to to geek out as much as you want uh, in terms of the movie making process. This this film in particular, though, I really want to start with because you've had uh, just the most incredible journey with it uh, this year. It's kind of run the gamut of, you know, Sundance and South by and I see you and Patton on the Today Show. So if you could just maybe step back and maybe talk to our audience about the journey that you've been on just with this film this year and being able to take it to all of these really exciting places uh, that any filmmaker would love to see their movie, you know, go to. So we premiered the movie uh, at South by Southwest where we won the grand jury in the audience award, which was a pretty phenomenal experience. It's something that I wasn't uh, expecting, um, but was, was thrilled to, to have happen. Uh, and then since then we've been taking the film to many other festivals, the Chicago film festival, the uh, Boston Seattle, Nantucket, uh, Dallas. We've really been traveling all around the country with the film. And uh, that's an experience that I had always really wanted to have early on in my filmmaking career. Um, sure. And uh, has just been, it has meant so much to be able to share the film with all these people than be able to talk with so many folks after after they've seen it. Not just from an audience standpoint, but just the communal aspect of other filmmakers. Like, how great is it to be at a festival and just, you know, share share war stories with people who are on the same path as you? It's so true, man. I mean, we, a lot of the same filmmakers will be playing their films around the country. So I've, I've run into some of the same folks again and again and have formed real friendships with them. And um you can, you know, th there's a level of candor that you can share with other filmmakers that you can't necessarily when you're out there just promoting a film. Right. What's a question that you get from other filmmakers uh, the most about your experience with this one? Oh, gosh, probably how I how I put it together. Uh, yeah. You know, everyone's always wondering how to finance a movie and how to how to package a film. It's definitely a question that I had prior to doing this and, and one that I still have as I move forward to, to bigger projects. Mm -hmm. uh, would you change anything about how you approached it? Um, I, th I think this the moment you decide I'm making this movie no matter what is I think the moment the movie actually gets made. Okay. Uh, and so I would, I think I would have made that decision sooner. Uh, but, but not, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy with how it went. Hmm. Uh, but having that level of commitment at each step of the process, 
I think is really necessary because everyone always wants to um, hedge and whatnot. And I think one's job as the filmmaker is to, to say we're doing this right now. And, right. and then we're, it, it forces everyone else's to take action. Well, and this being such a personal story for you, you know, you have to fight for for that vision every step of the way. And so by the time our, our listeners get to uh, this interview, they, they will be very familiar with what the film is about. I will set all that up for them. Um, but there are so many moments throughout the movie where the audience is, is absolutely going to just be like, no way, you know, ha- there's no way that that happened. And so I want you to just maybe talk a little bit about how much of the movie um, is exaggerated for dramatic purpose uh, I heard you talk about how the emotional aspect of the movie uh, is, is true and consistent, but, but you know, Patton talked about at one point that, you know, the actual story might not be that entertaining and you have to walk a line of like, you're still making a movie that people want to sit and watch. That's right. It's certainly not a documentary, but I wanted to, you know, um, I, I've talked a little bit about what actually happened. And it, basically I stopped talking to my dad a long time ago. I, I, blocked him on social media. I was going through a tough time. I wouldn't talk with him about it. I got home one day, this really pretty girl sent me a friend request online. I was very excited. She had all these incredible pictures, all the same interests as me. And then it turned out to be my dad. And and, uh, I wanted to uh, explore this as, as cinematically as I possibly could and explore all of the dynamics that went into this uh, and really do so from his perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I was writing the story, I wanted it to feel as close to my experience uh, a- around my relationship with my dad and um, and 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 also my relationship to to social media and and my relationship to love. Uh, and so I was not beholden to uh, exactitude around the literal events. And uh, but I was. I was trying to remain as as uh, loyal to the feelings around all of this as I possibly could, um, and the movie really is kind of a love letter to to my dad in a way. And so I wanted to uh, embed m- anecdotally uh, many moments throughout our lives together, and, and also uh, particular details that maybe he and he and I would be the only ones to to detect like uh the way I did my production design and um you know my dad drives the same car as Chuck does in the movie the his office was set up the exact same way uh and, and many other little details uh throughout the movie James, what was his reaction when you first told him it was going to become a movie I don't think he really believed me that I was going to make a movie of this scope yeah, uh, I made a micro budget feature a handful of years back, and I think maybe he thought it was going to be something like that. Mm. Uh, his, I think the first moment he really realized that I was actually doing this was actually at South by Southwest in an audience of 600 people <laughs> where he saw the movie for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and luckily he dug it. I mean, I think he, he, he was definitely, I, I think it's a mixed experience for him, but, uh, I, he, he, you know, I think the movie resonated with him in, in a, in a deep way. Didn't you guys do a Q and a at some we did. we did. Yeah. How did that go? <laughs> it was interesting. I mean, I, 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 it felt in line with the movie in a weird way. Um, <laughs> almost like, uh, an overshare or like, I, I don't know. I, I like blending, uh, the real and the fictional, and I, I like movies and, and TV shows that do that. And so uh, I try to do that as much as I can in, in my own work and in the way that I'm presenting my work to an audience. I would imagine that the audience has more questions for him following a screening than they do for you. Yeah, they, they did. <laughs> they, they certainly did. Yeah, like it's a joy to get to talk to you or to Patton, but like the, to have him there as a subject matter must have been pretty rare and unique. Yeah. And, and we, we did an interview with me, Pat and my dad with the New York times a few weeks ago. Uh, and so that was, that was, uh, that was an interesting experience for sure. So without giving away the specifics of it, um, when did you come up with what the ending of the film was going to be? Uh, I went through multiple drafts of the story and, um, it was a matter of really determining what this movie is about. 
Mm. Uh, and it's not necessarily about my character's actual actual love with this actual girl. Mm. Uh, the girl has no idea that her pictures have been used to create this profile. It has a lot more to do with the relationship between the father and the son and, and uh, this kind of reckoning with uh, – uh, the the imperfections of, of one another and and the the shortcomings of one with one another and and so I wanted the end of the movie to reflect that and that came fairly late in the process actually. I want to talk about Claudia, uh, who really blows me away uh, as a screen partner for you. Um, and specifically, I think she's a really difficult part, obviously, on so many different levels. And I want to talk about how you guys sort of figured out how she's going to act like she's speaking chat dialogue which is something that's, you know, part of our everyday life. But to see it personified was so unique and, and creative. So I just want to know how you guys sort of got to that level. Figuring that out was pivotal. Um, you know, I, I wanted everything that she said to feel very naturalistic. But I also, as I was writing it, was as precise as I could be around Chuck's experience uh, writing everything that she's saying okay um, she she's ultimately playing three or four different parts in the movie she's playing uh franklin's ideal projection of who this person could be right. she's playing the real becca that we meet at the diner she's playing um she's kind of playing uh chuck in a weird way like her awareness that it's actually chuck talking peeks through a few times sure and then she's also kind of playing uh, Chuck's girlfriend, Erica, when he uses her words as a way of um, <laughs> as a way of uh, figuring out what to say next. So it was a complicated uh, role to play and required a lot of uh, just mapping in terms of how this character was going to function throughout the story. Now, because you mentioned those four different uh, approaches, did you guys come up with like things that would differentiate each voice uh, as she was doing those? Yeah. So we, we definitely created a physical distinction between uh, her materialization uh, in Franklin's imagination. And then we, we also, and then her, her as a real person. I mean, Becca as a real person has a lot clearer boundaries. She's a little more closed off and jaded and, and, and has just, uh, she's not as open to connecting uh, with another person and, um, you know, has her own personal life that she's working through and, and is a real person. So she's not um, as immediately uh, amicable. Um, and, and then with the the imaginary Becca, you know, she's uh, exactly what Franklin needs in that moment. Yeah. She's also his dad. So we wanted to through rehearsals we figured out certain physicalizations that chuck was going to be doing uh that Patton was going to be doing and then ways that we could mirror that in in claudia's scenes mm -hmm. um and and so we wanted those to be as tethered as as we could make them when did you come up with the idea for visualizing uh how the reality is starting to bleed in <laughs> to to essentially your character's journey, where where then when Patton shows up in places where he imagined Becca to be. I knew I wanted to tell this story, but I also knew I didn't want audiences to be looking at screens for an hour and a half. Oh, interesting. Sure. And so I, so I thought a lot about what it feels like when we're messaging someone. And it often feels like the person is appearing, you know, it, 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 you're you're projecting so much onto that person and onto their uh, their essence, so to speak. And so I figured, why not just have that person appear? Uh, and it would allow it to feel cinematic. Uh, and it would also create this irony where we're having to remind ourselves that this beautiful girl is actually Franklin's dad. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's fun, I think, because we're so used to seeing, uh, we're, we're so used to rooting for on-screen romances and we were almost trained as an audience to root for them. So to have there be this other layer was, was so fun to play with uh, throughout the process. That's fascinating. Okay. I'm going to ask you a weird question. Um, if we were back in the blockbuster video days, uh, what section would you rank? Would you put this movie into? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, 
I mean, pro- probably in, in comedy. I, okay. I would probably slot it in there. Okay. Because it fits in horror also. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would it, it would it would involve a lot of arguing with the blockbuster employees about uh, <laughs> where exactly we should put it. Uh, there's a technical shot that I would love to get your breakdown of. Um, and I'm sorry if you've talked about this a lot, but I haven't seen it anywhere. It's the pool shot of Becca plunging into the water mm. uh, at the minute of the breakup, which I think is such an outstanding visualization of, of the, the bubble sort of bursting. How did you shoot that? Yeah, so so that moment, um, I wanted her to walk out onto the water because she's essentially going somewhere that Franklin can't. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it's kind of signaling her departure from from uh their being able to connect um in terms of how we shot that i i i had a plexiglass uh counter built uh so that you know i we measured the the distance between the bottom of the pool to the surface of the water and uh and then had a um had a counter built essentially that was like a walkway um and then it was just a matter of, yeah, I mean, the, the having her walk walk down it and then uh, scrubbing it out in post. Um, and then um, in terms of her dropping down, you know, um, she's, it, it was just us working with the cuts. I mean, there was a few different ways that we were going to do it. Uh, we were thinking about VFXing her whole body off. Okay. Uh, and then having it just plop down that ended up uh, working less well than just uh, cutting from a close to a wide where she's falling in. Have you um, thought a bit about um, how tech savvy uh, and visual savvy an audience member is nowadays in terms of what they can do on their own and when, what they bring to not expectations, but just like um, a skill level and a storytelling level, storytelling level that they bring to projects nowadays? I, I do think about that a lot. It um, it makes me always err towards simplicity mm. because I don't think we're as impressed by CGI tricks and especially uh, a movie of this scale. We're not going to be able to compete with uh, the, the the visualizations of a, of a Marvel movie that audiences are so used to seeing. So you, you're not going to win that game, So but you can win the game of simplicity uh and and clarity and i would rather uh do something simply and cleanly that really works as opposed to uh taking a big um swing with either cgi or or the way we're executing i find that it often becomes more about the filmmaker uh trying to show off and 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 be clever than the story and and so i would often have to exercise my own restraint and and just do things as simply as i could so that we're not i didn't want the audience to be thinking about the filmmaking i wanted them to really be able to concentrate on the story itself okay but going forward though i'm curious what aspect you want to continue to to push yourself in further is it as a director um is it as a leading man uh, do you want to continue to direct things that you show up in what are you how are you curious about moving forward yeah i you know i've always i started out as a director really i mean i didn't think about it that way when i was a kid but i was always making videos always editing and and telling stories uh, my acting career, uh, was what kind of began first in, in terms of my being able to do this professionally. Um, but I, I kind of see it, um, uh, I, I look at it story by story, really, okay. whatever makes the most sense, uh, and whatever I have the strongest feeling around is the thing that I'll, I'll pursue. Um, and if I, you know, I, I have stories that I'm really excited about, uh, that I'm putting together where I'll, that I'm writing and directing. And, and then the casting consideration comes later um, in, you know, it's like, do I think I'm the best person to play this role? Will it give me um, the most creative skin in the game if I do this? Or is there someone that's better suited? Um, I, I try to look at the casting as a, as a separate piece. And, and the, the, the strength of the story is really what comes first for me. James, one of the things I can say about this film is that there's no wasted scene. Like every little, every bit that's there is moving everything along. So I'm curious um, how much you enjoy the editing process. Do you enjoy it more than the on-set capturing of it all? Do you, do you like to put it together better? 
I do. I, I, I much prefer the editing process. I mean, that you're, it allows you to really be a lot more introspective than you can be during production. Uh, and you're essentially playing with, you know, you're, you're assembling this large puzzle and you're, you're doing it. You know, I, I love my editor, Josh Crockett. And so being able to spend so much time together and just hang out and, and do a deep dive on the story together. Right. Uh, it's just a really fulfilling process. And you're not, you know, you're dealing with the limitations of whatever you've captured. And then it's just a matter of figuring out how best to tell the story with the pieces that you have. And, um, you know, it, it allows you to really meditate on, on uh, how best to tell this story. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's certainly my favorite part of the process. And to that end, did you get to test this with an audience? I yeah, I would have screenings every weekend um, at at our edit bay. And then I would just talk to audiences and see what was uh, resonating with them, what they felt like they were unclear on. Uh, I did a lot of that. And then we did a couple screenings in theaters where we'd fill the theater and then we'd have uh, talkbacks with an audience and and uh be able to kind of workshop certain things uh fr from that uh feedback that we got yeah because this movie is a dance you know and there are times where if you push it too far you could lose the audience absolutely 100 percent. i mean the thing that was hard to calibrate uh was if, if franklin um Chuck's what Chuck did to Franklin to make Franklin so upset needed to be significant enough where we understood why Chuck, why Franklin was cutting Chuck out of his life, mm -hmm. but not so severe that it made us hate Chuck. Sure. Right. And so calibrating that uh, was, was definitely an emotional dance because if it's if it's too slight an offense, we think Franklin is overreacting and we're not with him. If right. it's too severe, we're out. We dislike Chuck too much. Well, and you know what's interesting, too, is because obviously you want Patton, you know, any chance you get an opportunity to cast him in that part. But he brings uh, some dark comedic roles that he's done, too. And if people are familiar with his work, you know, then they bring a bit of judgment uh, to Chuck right off the bat, which is something you have to work around. That's right. I think... Patton also has uh, he 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 brings with him a natural likability too that's working in the character's favor, um, and and was part of the reason why I thought he was so perfect for the role. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, James, I'll get you out of here on this one. Um, you mentioned that you credit your therapist as sort of prodding you to make this story, uh, but now that you can step back and take a look at it, did it help? I, I think so. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I love telling stories that feel like, uh, like I shouldn't be telling them. Uh, that's, I love stories like that. Right. Um, they're the ones that make me lean in the most. So, uh, I definitely want to continue to challenge myself to, um, be risky in my storytelling. Cause if I'm gonna, I don't know, I don't, I don't think I, I don't ever want to be playing it safe. Uh, I, I see that as my role as a filmmaker is to to rip myself as wide, wide open so that uh, and, and share what's inside. Has the reception of this movie opened up a lot of doors for you? It has. Yeah, it certainly has. You know, there's there's some really exciting stuff coming my way. And, and now it's just a matter of figuring out, uh, you know, what I can get the most excited about. Good, man. Well, I hope we uh, have you back on the show with the, whatever your next project is. I hope so, too, man. Thanks so much to James for coming on The Real Blend Show. Make sure you guys check out I Love My Dad when it's playing at a theater near you. Uh, we're going to be back on Friday with a full show, so make sure you guys circle back around and check that one out. And uh, we also have some really exciting directors uh, coming onto the show uh, in the near future. If you saw, we ran a couple of stories from uh, a sit-down with Scott Derrickson. We wanted to get some of those stories out, and he's going to become a guest on the show uh, very soon, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And to make sure that you don't miss any of the content that we put out as part of The Real Blend Podcast, uh, hit subscribe, turn on your notifications, and follow along here as we continue to bring you all the cool Real Blend content that you guys are looking for.